Good evening and welcome to yet another virtual event. My name is Adam and I'm the director of events at Tattered Cover. We have partnered with Books and Books and BookBug to pre present this amazing conversation. I wanna thank you for your patience. There was just some behind the scenes technical difficulties, which you would think after two years in the pandemic we would have solved, but they still pop up. Um, if you haven't purchased a, uh, the book for tonight, uh, Glory by Novaila Bulawayo, uh, you can purchase it now at tattercover.com, Books and Books or at BookBug. Uh, tonight's guest is the author of We Need New Names and the most recent book, Glory. Uh, we Need New Names was a finalist for the Man Booker Prize and won the Penn Hemingway Award and the LA Times Book Prize for First Fiction and many other awards. Uh, she grew up in Zimbabwe and now lives in the U.S. I'm, of course, talking about Novaila Bulawayo. And in conversation with her is an amazing author, uh, Mega Majumdar. Uh, she is the author of the best, uh, New York Times bestseller and editor's choice, A Burning. Uh, she was born and raised in India, where and she moved to the United States to attend college at Harvard University, uh, followed by graduate school in social anthropology at Johns Hopkins University. She now works as an editor at Catapult and lives in New York City. Uh, please welcome Noviolet and Mega for this amazing conversation. And thank you again for Books and Books and BookBug for doing this with Tattered Cover. Um, ladies, welcome. How are you all doing this evening? Great. Thank you so much, Adam. Yo, I'll hop off, but if anyone has a question, anyone in the audience, you can ask it in the YouTube chat and I'll make sure both of these amazing authors get to it. Wonderful. Thanks, Adam. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, can I just say we're here to celebrate glory and I loved this book. Um, no, Violet, if you will allow me to embarrass you and do a very tiny intro before you read. Um, I, I am in love with this book. It's so playful. It's so funny. It's full of rage and heartbreak. It's about ordinary people or rather ordinary animals living within unjust systems everywhere. And it's really like no other novel that I've read recently. Um, and this event is very special for me because I also loved We Need New Names. Um, this book was actually a gift from my husband, Noviolet, for my birthday back when it came out. And if we were doing this in person, I would be asking you to sign it. Um, but Glory is so marvelously different and I'm going to let you introduce it and read for us. All right. Um, thank you for that beautiful introduction. And thank you to Tattered Cover, Books and Books. And of course, this is a bookstore and book bag from my second hometown of Kalamazoo, Michigan. And thank you to everyone in the audience for, for tuning in. It's such a pleasure to be sharing glory. So I'll just read from the opening couple of pages. I won't introduce the book. Hopefully that will inspire people to, to, to grab a copy. The section is called Independence. The subsection rally. When at last the father of the nation arrived for the Independence Day celebrations, no earlier than 328 in the afternoon, the citizens congregated at the Jidada Square since morning had had it with waiting they could have raised the wall of Jidada with their frustration alone. That is, if Jidada had been any other place. But the land of farm animals wasn't any other place. It was Jidata. Yes, Toluhuti Jidata with a da and another da. And just remembering this simple fact was enough to make most of the animals keep their feelings inside like intestines. The fierce son, said by those who knew about things to have been part of His Excellency's cheerleading squad by decree, had been up glaring since morning, since mid-morning doling out forceful rays fit for a ruler whose reign was nearing all of not one, not two, not three, but four solid decades. The Chitata party regalia worn by most of the animals for the occasion, jackets and shirts and skirts and hats and scarves in various colors of the flag of the nation, many of the articles embossed with the face of his excellency, trapped the sun's terrible heat and made the weight even more unbearable. But not all of the animals were going to stand for the torturous weight. Some indeed started to leave, 
grumbling about having work and things to do, about places to go to, about the leaders of other lands who arrived at things right on time, like God's infallible machete. These disgruntled animals started as just a smattering, two pigs, a cat, and a goose, but the fraction very quickly grew to a respectable mass and emboldened by both their number and the sound of their own voices, the dissidents headed for the exit. At the gate, the group found themselves face to face with the Jitata defenders, Tolu to the dogs appropriately armed with batons, ropes, gloves, tiakas, canisters, shields, guns, and such typical weapons of defending. It was a known fact all over the nation and beyond its borders that Jitata defenders were by nature violent, morbid beasts, but it was especially the presence of the notorious Commander Jambanja, distinguishable in his signature white bandana, that made the dissenters promptly turn around and retrace their steps, miserable tails between their legs. Enter the father of the nation, the ruler whose reign is longer than the nine lifespans of a hundred cats, also the longest serving leader in a continent of long serving leaders and indeed in the whole wide world. Now his excellency's car wove its way through the throngs with the slowness of a hiss, and the animals fell over themselves like intoxicated frogs, hoping to catch a glimpse of the legendary father of the nation. At this point, the sun, upon seeing arrive the leader who was decreed by God himself to rule and rule and keep ruling, a leader who'd in turn decreed the very sun to head his cheerleading squad, took a deep, deep breath and thoroughly blazed to impress. A select group of dignitaries, all Mars, most of them old, accompanied His Excellency on hind legs. Accompanying the accompanying dignitaries were decorated defender leaders in military gear, colorful embroidered ropes cinched at the waist, caps pulled low, shiny constellations of medals glinting on solid chests, star insignias bouncing off the shoulders white gloves on front paws. These were the generals. Tolwood is the true linchpin of His Excellency's rule. Throughout the square, animals whipped out their phones and gadgets to take pictures and videos of the procession of power. Behold him. Yes, Tolwood him and only him himself, the anointed one, the only one, the supreme one, the most magnificent one. With the arrival of His Excellency, Jitada Square came alive. Toluti, the father of the nation, had such an aura that his mere presence in any space automatically rearranged the atoms in the air and shifted any given mood, no matter how hostile or dismal or foul, to a positive and electric one. Those who know about things say this quality had especially been a dozenfold more potent a long, long time ago during the first years of His Excellency's rule, when his appearance alone made unripe things instantly ripen to the point of rotting, cured the sick of whatever ailments molested them, turned rocks to mush, deactivated storms and heat waves, rerouted floods, wildfires, and plagues of locusts, cured fatal viruses before they even thought of attacking, made dry rivers overflow with water. Yes, Toluti, the father of the nation's appearance alone, had once upon a time started engines, burned steel beam beams, and in separate documented occasions, made scores and scores of virgins pregnant, so that long before he married the donkey and sired children with her, streams of His Excellency's blood were already flowing throughout Jidada. And now, here was the father of the nation, lighting up Jidada Square by merely happening, by simply being there. The place ignited in flaming applause, and even the animals who not too long ago had been trying to leave were now part of the uproar, standing on hind legs and cheering His Excellency, not just with their voices and bodies, no, but also with their hearts and minds and souls. Cows mood, cats mewed, 
sheep bleated, bulls bellowed, ducks quagged, donkeys brayed, goats bleated, horses neighed, pigs grunted, chickens clagged, peacocks screamed, and geese cackled. The cacophony reaching deafening levels as the entourage of power came to a final stop in front of a raised platform. Okay. Thank you. Um, so as you just read to us from the beginning, we, we, read, we heard about a political rally where all the members are animals. And, and this is really um, an incredibly inventive thing that this book does. Can you talk about coming to the idea for this book? Um, the idea fell on my lap in the form of the Zimbabwean coup that deposed uh, Robert Mugabe in, back in uh, November 2017. So in many ways, I feel lucky because I didn't have to do the hard work of trying to figure out what my next book was going <laughs> to be about at a time when everybody was waiting for it. But I, I knew the moment that happened that um, I needed to write a story. At the time, I thought it was going to be a work of, of, of nonfiction um, because I was just interested in making sense of the moment, in making sense of uh, what Mugabe had done to us, where he had taken us and where we were potentially going. I was able to be on the ground a couple of weeks later and for the next few months after that. But in the course of that time, so much work was produced by people, some of them more capable than I was in, in the genre of, of nonfiction um, and political analysis. And as a creative, I very quickly realized that I was running the risk of coming up with a book whenever I finished it, that would be too late to the party. Um, that would have nothing new or interesting to say. That was when I started to uh, make the choice to, to, to tend to my, you know, my natural mode, which is fiction. Um, I remember George Orwell was turning up in our social media conversations. And that inspired me to think uh, deeply about using the animal kingdom. And lucky enough for me, I already had another resource in the form of my grandmother's stories uh, told throughout my childhood. And I actually realized that animals promised a fresh and exciting way for me to take ownership of a story that everybody else, that was very public, that everybody else seemed to have taken ownership of they also gave me the distance from, from the story room to create my own story within a public story and take it wherever I wanted. So that's the, the story of, of glory, of how glory was born in its um, current form. Mm. You know, something that struck me is that the book is, um, it is obviously, you know, very much about people living in a place where um, fuel prices are going up, they're dealing with power cuts, you know, there's a minor but very memorable character of a teacher who sells um, clothes and bread on the side to make a living. And it's, it's, it's set in Zimbabwe, but I feel like the reality that you're talking about, it's, it's so many countries across the world. Um, and part of what I loved is along with this very intellectually serious project, the book feels so playful so funny. Can you talk about finding that tone for the book? Um, you know, I, I tend to, to be drawn toward heavy, um, even depressing subjects, if you will. <laughs> and so humor is almost necessary for my material to be approachable, to be tolerable, even for me during the process of, of, of creating it. Um, I insist on finding joy, on finding pleasure of being entertained as I write. But that said, it's also important to remember that, you know, no matter how miserable our circumstances are, humor and joy are such basic human impulses that never leave us. You know, you can go to the poorest place on earth 
and find some of the happiest people um, on earth. So I, I really wanted to keep sight of, 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 you know, of that part of uh, this, the, 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 the landscape that I was dealing with. And as, as Zimbabwe and myself, you know, I'm always humbled and inspired by, you know, the humor of my people, regardless of what we're going through. You know, I think we're some of the funniest people in this whole wide world. <laughs> <laughs> to quote the the the, the leader of Chitata. So yeah, yeah, it's always a joy to bring that into into the work. Yeah, I love that. Um, but you know, like we were saying, there there is um, there is material that feels really urgent and really serious. And can I tell you about a couple lines that I am hoping you'll tell us more about? Sure. Um, there are lines here that go. All my life I'd heard said this thing about tears, that they are a language, that they do indeed speak. And that day under that Mabrosi, I witnessed, I heard, I understood the clarity, the absolute eloquence of tears. And that moment, I, I just stopped reading because I felt like that moment in the book, it was really traveling all the scales of this book. It was about being in a vulnerable human body. It's about love and how it transcends language. It's also about despair in the face of brutality because those moments are true too. And you know, the helplessness one feels in a society where one has very little recourse. But can you speak about writing those lines and that section? No, I'm laughing because I had, to be, I had to think, okay, did I write that line? I, I guess I did. <laughs> Has it been that so, long? <laughs> um, you know, I, I wrote this thing in a weird trance. So, um, but anyway, I, I think I remember that section. It's, it's, it's when they are witnessing um, the killing of, 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 um, of the uncle. Um, and 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 yes, it's a it's a very very dense, um, very heavy, very tragic and heartbreaking moment. But it's still a moment that I need the reader to sit with, um, not only because it's part of the story, but it comes from a very real place, a very sad chapter of 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 Zimbabwe's history. Um, but I try to render such moments in in a language that that holds them to the sun um, that gives them beauty that gives them the weight that i think uh, they deserve so it's it's i do try to pressure my language towards towards those moments if that makes sense pressure your language yeah i love that yeah. um, and now i'm very curious to to hear about your writing process for this book how long did it take what did it look like um it took about three and a half years you know sometimes it's, it's strange to quantify creative projects in terms of time you know because uh I realized that some of the material that ended up making its way into the the novel is material I'd set with for for even longer, but I just didn't know what to do with it. Especially the the the, the part about the, the that you just referred referenced uh, the mass killings, for instance, is something that has haunted me. I've carried it. I've not known what to do with it until Glory gave me the opportunity. Um, but if we are to be technical, start you know starting. I started my research in uh, 20, 2017, November. And I think by 2018, 2019, I was in the middle of my, my edit drafts. Um, a lot of rewriting happened, mostly because, you know, I also believe first drafts don't really count. Writing is rewriting. And I just had a stellar team of, 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 of um, editors and my agent who really pushed me to, to be rethinking the book and deliver better. Um, and we finished the last draft sometime in uh, around September last year, the, the revisions. It was a hard um, project to do. It was the hardest thing, one of the hardest things I've ever done. I think I was in a state of shock. You know, you write your first novel. Um, 
I feel like I didn't know what I was doing when I was writing in it. And that's part of the beauty of the first book. We are writing in the dark, but with glory, I there had been some growth, understandably. Um, but the book just challenged and drained and demanded a lot uh, from me. It was such a monster. So the process was, was hard, um, but it was still a delightful challenge to, you know, to, to sit with it and, and figure the book out. Mm. Can you recall one, um, one way in which your, your agent or your editor kind of pushed the book or, or um, helped a transformation happen within the book? Um, I think all of all of them actually um, fell in love with Destiny right away. Mm. The way I had initially rendered her was not, you know, she she just showed up, but I wasn't invested in her at the time. But they very they were very quick to say, okay, this is a character that we want to hear more of. What's her story? Um, where is she going? What does she want? And all that. And I'm really grateful for eyes that can sometimes see what I don't see, but, but need to see. So that's, I think that's one good example. Yeah, that's a great example. And speaking of destiny, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, um, for everybody watching who hasn't yet read the book, destiny is, is a character within the book. And um, there are lines that go, um, destiny finally understood with a gutting clarity that her mother wasn't really ironing clothes or material, but was rather ironing some parts of herself. Yes, it was therapy. And the suffering of women who still have to fulfill their duties, still have to do what's needed and keep moving forward, you know, they, they cannot fall apart. The suffering of women is very much present in the book. Can you talk about writing, the writing around women or, or females as, as they are in this book? Um, it felt like an important project because from the onset, I knew that they needed to be centered um, in a text that's inspired by a space where women are deemed um, lesser, um, where women's contributions and part of Jidata's obsessions, of course, is power, the question of power. And part of the party of power's obsessions is that it's a muscular project, that it's, it's, the, it's the males, the males who liberated Jidata, who made the contributions who built the country. But I was interested in excavating the histories and the stories and the real contributions of women, not just in the struggle itself, but in the day-to-day -day lives of, of Chidada, um, their mothers. The most potent resistance, in my opinion, in the novel, The Sisters of the Disappeared, um, is made up of women who then could go on to recruit men as they go around. There is Duchess, the spirit medium, who is representative of the indigenous um, spiritual healer who sort of holds the community together and kind of plays their own part in, in challenging the resistance. And of course there's Destiny and her mother who are traumatized, who are wounded, um, but they face their own trauma in their own ways and end up providing the point of the turning point that actually um, Accords to data a different destiny. So I was interested in really centering the women, but also giving them roles that I felt um, spoke to spoke to their power. You know, as they participate and exist in our in our societies. Yeah, and speaking of power, you know, there was um, there was a part in your book which was really striking a line which I am now going to butcher, forgive me, but it was something about how the problem with Jadada was that the citizens were used to things that should have made them very angry, that they had settled for things that, that should have caused them outrage. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that happened in, in such a society? 
Um, I think it's because many, many factors, but I think one of the obvious ones is fear. Um, Jadadans are a very traumatized nation. And part of that trauma actually um, dates back to the early years of Jadadas independence, that very violent period um, that we we're just speaking about. And so they live with the memory of, of that horror, even though it's unprocessed, even though they don't talk about it, but they seem to understand what their leaders are capable of. And so it is easier for them to just um, let themselves be, be victims. Um, there is also an element of, you know, possibly letting the one leader who has presided over the country for clearly for over um, four decades become the monster that he ends up becoming simply by just giving him space. And I think part of why the end of the book is, is leads to the uh, conclusion that it, it reaches is because citizens just get up one day and decide, you know, we're not going to be participants in our oppression anymore. They start by resisting the defenders, the dogs, who are at first shocked by the fact that the, they are being resisted. But they are also inspired somehow to actually join um, the, the, the citizens and refused, and refused to, to, to defend the seat of power and they refuse to stand in the way of, of, of change. So that, yeah, I think those are the, 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 my main concerns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, can, I, can I take a step back and ask you, you sure. know, you've written two books. Do you see themes, questions emerging in your work that you feel will remain obsessions for you throughout your writing life? <laughs> uh, that's a difficult question because you know I'm I'm hoping one of my future projects just surprises me and allows me to reinvent myself, you know. Um, and I'm hoping that I actually do get tired of some of these themes. <laughs> that would make for an interesting, uh, yeah, an, an interesting body of work. Yeah, but but for now I'm interested in questions of power, um, uh, nationalism, uh, colonialism, post-colonialism. Um, I'm interested in voices of, of the vulnerable. I'm interested in the question of borders, crossing borders. I, I think my protagonist, Darling, and uh, what's her name, Destiny, kind of mirror each other in, in I wasn't really thinking of that connection. It's strange how I, I, I notice it now that the book is out that, okay, one left and the other one comes back. So mm -hmm. yes, it's, it's interesting to see those, um, those themes start to, yeah, just to start to shape themselves into a pattern. And I'm curious to see where I go from here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your 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 grandma telling you stories when you were a kid, and the the interest in in stories and narratives is definitely so beautifully present in this book. There's a line. Sorry to quote so much from your book. It's just a beautiful book full of lines that I wanted to underline. Um, but there's a line about how you know, isn't it, isn't it true that stories are able to um, raise the dead as if the dead were, were just waiting. Again, I'm butchering this. I'm very sorry. We're just yeah, it's fine. Butcher, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> to, be, to be animated by our tongues. Can you, can you take us back to um, your childhood or, or whatever stage you feel like going back to and telling us how you came to writing to begin with? Um. You know, I, I came into consciousness already surrounded by stories, but my, my grandmother, um, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather actually had four wives, um, but it was a senior wife who seemed to be in charge of the storytelling. And now that I understand story and what makes a story, I do realize that out of all our grandmothers, she was the only one who could have done the job better. You know, she, she just understood the craft. She had such a mastery of, of language. 
Um, and she was, yeah, she was just amazing. She was just magical. And we would sit around the fire and just listen. And as a child, I remember that I used to watch her mouth a lot. It makes sense because the stories sort of seem to pour out of her mouth, you know. And during the day, I would just watch her mouth as she went about her business, waiting for the duck so that that mouth would open and these stories would um, kind of gush out. I love that during the day we imitated her by telling, relaying those stories to each other or to friends of ours who didn't, you know, have the have the experience. But I think I was in some form of informal school. I started to learn quite a lot about language from her, um, about things like voice, how to put a story together, how to be entertaining, how to talk to, 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 to an audience. Um, and then in terms of the court, the, the question of, you know, the dead living in our mouths, I was also fascinated. I lost my mom at a very young age, but I was fascinated by how I used to love understandably just listening to people talk about her. Um, I was a kid. I came from a culture where kids were not addressed. You know, nobody came to you and said, hey, nobody, let me talk to you about your mother. But two adults would just start talking about it in my presence. I don't know if it was for my benefit or they were talking. But moments like those made me realize that, you know, my mom sort of came alive for me when people opened their mouths and started talking. Um, and of course, I know now that, you know, there's a, let me backtrack a little bit. There's a, a beautiful Ndewele saying, um, that's my language that says, uh, the people will die, the names will remain. I think a name becomes a name in part when we speak it, when we say it loud. So when we talk of the dead, I think it's that same dynamic. Uh, when we talk of the dead, we call the names, by calling the names, by telling their stories, these people suddenly emerge. You know, I can tell you the story of somebody who lived, what they did and all that. And I really find that um, very, very beautiful. And I wanted to kind of bring that to Jidada, you know, starting with, with citizens, writing the names of, of, of the dead on the wall, um, following Destiny's mother, actually telling her own history, opening this whole world that was secret, that Destiny never knew. But suddenly her grandfather, her grandmother, her uncles and aunts are raised from the dead and they become real. And, you know, they, they really change her relationship, um, both with her mother, but the country as well. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. Um, we have questions starting to come in and I'll remind everybody watching that you can send Novala your questions. Um, and also this is a good time to um, go to the bookstore page for glory, get yourself a copy, understand fully what Novala is talking about in this beautiful book. Um, the first question is from Kelly. What was the hardest part of writing this novel? And I'll add a second part of part to that question, which is what was the most fun part? So what was hard and what was fun? Um, what was hard? There was enough that was hard in terms of uh, subject material writing the parts about the, the Gukura Hundi, the, the massacre, the mass murders that happened in Zimbabwe between the years of 80, 1983 to 1987 was very hard um, to pull off. Um, but then I was encouraged by the fact that it was a story that needed to be told. I was encouraged by the fact that um, some of my peers had told that story um, and opened doors for me in a way. People like amazing writers like Novio, Rosa Chuma, Tuya Gloria and Lovo, Christopher Mlalazi, and the many informal um, writers and just people who were sharing that story online. What was also hard was writing a story that was happening 
in real time as I was writing, especially with the early drafts, because there were moments where I would go to sleep and think, I don't know what these idiots will do while I'm sleeping. That will affect my novel, you know. Um, and then I'll wake up and have to juggle, move things, move pieces around. That was before I gave myself the permission to make glory its own thing. That was inspired by the real story, but didn't necessarily um, depend on it. The parts that were fun to write were parts where I was taking jabs at, at the seat of power. You know, yeah, it, it, it really gave me satisfaction to, to, to imagine um, certain characters the way I did. Yeah, I love that. Um, we have a question from Mary. How have both Zimbabwe and America formed how you think about the language? Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's complicated. Zimbabwe is where my, is the place I owe my mother tongue. It gave me my mother tongue. And for me, that's really the language of intimacy. I think it's the dominant language in my writing, in my, in my, uh, creative work, even though what readers see looks like English, but that would definitely not exist um, without, without a Sindabele. Um, and then the US, um, it has forced me to, to find common ground between a language that I, I just I just struggle with English. I don't understand why, because it's an official language in Zimbabwe. People speak it. I have friends and family who express themselves better in English than you know in our in our uh, mother tongues. I just don't understand what the problem with me is. It could be because I chose at an earlier age that this the other language was the language of my uh, creation. But it's it's just beautiful to have two two languages that sometimes fight and struggle, but force me at some point to find common ground in a way that, um, that, that works. Yeah. Um, and you can really see the texture of both languages um, in, in glory, just really, really imbricated in a really beautiful way. Um, there's a question from Linda. Do you plan to explore the themes you talked about tonight from an American view? I guess, are you interested in writing a, a future book set, set in the US and asking questions about power? No, I, I have no idea. I can't speak about what I'm going to do tonight. I'm just, I'm just tired after glory. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I did want to ask you more about what you were saying about English, because it struck me that, you know, I have a similar experience with English. We, we grew up speaking it in India, but I still struggled to learn it. And mm. I had a very hard time learning it when I was um, a kid because we did not speak English at home. And now I do feel that my mother tongue comes into my English work as well. Um, do you think that you will ever write in your mother tongue? Have you already written in your mother tongue? Yes, I've actually, I do have a published story um, in my mother tongue in an anthology called Tapuluju for Fondebele speakers and Zulu speakers in the audience. And uh, it, I, I, loved, I loved the writing it. I actually wrote quite well in my mother tongue before I wrote uh, you know, sensible stuff in English. Again, because it's, it's uh, I didn't have to learn it, you know, I owned it. I did not need to find the keys for it, you know. And um, yeah, I, th I think if I were to write a novel in my mother tongue, I, I, I would totally be able to do that. Maybe that's thinking of future works. I think that would be an interesting um, challenge to myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about how you didn't speak English at home. That was the case with, with me. So we encountered it in the classroom from some of our teachers who didn't even speak it well because they didn't speak it at home. Yeah. So <laughs> and we yeah. just sit there and laugh at them, which are this language. And we'll be thinking, why, why don't you teach us in our native languages? 
Mm-hmm. It is quite interesting when you think about decolonization and how, you know, yeah, how the experience would have been if we were taught in our own languages. But yeah, so it really was hard to form an intimacy with a language that you encountered for a limited time. You went home, your playground was in your native language and yeah. Absolutely. In our school, we were punished for speaking our mother tongue instead of English. Were you scolded for speaking your mother tongue? We were scolded sometimes, depending on the school. Sometimes we were punished. I think um, Nguki Wathiongo is a brilliant essay that talks about, you know, um, being punished as well, which is which is really sad, which is really sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, here's a question from John for both of us. What books or authors have inspired you lately? Uh, what books or authors have inspired? So that's such a, a hard question. But for Glory, um, some of my companions were dictator novels like Wizard of the Crow, again by Nguki uh, Wathiongo. Um, the Brief Wonders Life of Oscar Wao by Juno Diaz, um, Autumn of the Patriarch by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, one of my most favorite writers, uh, Feast of the Gods. Yeah, those, those are some of the, the books that I was sitting with. That's great. Um, for me, um, one that I've been thinking about is A Passage North. Have you read this one, Noelet? No, I um, haven't. A Passage North by Anuk Arud Pragasam. It's it's a really beautiful novel set in Sri Lanka, and it's very it's very deliberate and gentle yeah. in the writing about um, the relationship between um, grandmother and grandson among yeah. among lots else. It's really oh. really beautiful. Oh, nice. um, I think we have time for a couple more questions, so bring them in. But meanwhile, I want to ask you a craft question. I'm sure there are lots of writers in the room, and I wonder if you would share um, a piece of craft advice that you find energizing or helpful. Mm, A a piece of craft advice. Uh, That is hard. But let me talk about my early, my uh, first draft that might still be relevant. So my, my first draft was about 729 pages. It was such a, <laughs> a thick pile. And I'm, I'm not too crazy about, you know, big books because I feel like some of them have no business being big books. But here I was, I produced the 700 uh, page page draft and I remember some of the helpful advice from my brilliant editors was to sort of find the parts of the story. You know, they were not prescriptive in terms of okay, this should stay, this is this should go. Um, but yeah, they, they really forced me to figure out where the story, where the story was, where I thought the story was. And um I, I have been doing this for quite a while, um, but it's interesting how every a new project can actually take you back to square zero, where what you know don't may not necessarily necessarily save you. So it was the, for me the willingness to go back and just you know tear the thing apart in search of of a story made me realize how important it was to be your own reader, you know, um, to try and find where, where the story was, to find, try and find what matters in your, in your writing, because at the end of the day, you are going to do the, the shaping of the story. So for, the, for emerging writers, I think that's, um, that's something that, you know, you should always be pushing yourself to figure out where is the story, where are the parts points, why am I, why am I writing the way, well, the way I, am, I am writing? These are questions we need to ask ourselves. Um, I know that sometimes when they come from somebody else, especially in workshop, <laughs> they may not come out, come out well, you know, but train yourself to be your, 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 your number, you know. Yeah, train yourself to be the main reader of your work. Yeah, I love that. 
Um, we have two more questions um, and probably just enough time for two more questions. So here's one um, from Libria who, who works with you, is on your publicity team. Um, oh, how did you choose particular animal characters or did they come naturally while writing? I think they, uh, they came kind of naturally. I went with general characteristics for instance, for the powerful animals, I tended towards like animals of physical strength, the horses and uh, horses and donkeys. I think we only have one donkey who's really powerful. Most of them are horses. And then uh, they are, of course, the, the, vicious, the vicious dogs. So these are animals that are either strong um, or aggressive. And then for the citizens, because I really wanted to align them with, with common everyday people who did not necessarily have power, they tend to be um, smaller, less, in, uh, less imposing, imposing animals. And I think I did consider having wild animals as part of the book, but it just felt like a lot of work trying to deal with the wild animal kingdom because there's so much, so much range so sticking to farm animals was my way of making the project um, manageable. Yeah. Thank you, great question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and our last question before we invite Adam back on screen is from Joanna. Um, and Joanna is asking about a word that comes up over and over in this book, which I was thinking about too, actually. Are you able to speak about the meaning of Tolukuti? No, I'm not going to answer that one. So, <laughs> I won't answer that one. So, we tried, no, Violet, we tried. <laughs> you, you tried, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, you, you'll find it, you'll find it. Maybe Adam can answer it for us. I can't answer any <laughs> questions, no. Um, <laughs> I will say, this was a lovely conversation. I want to thank you for your patience as I dealt with behind the scene things. Um, Thank you. Uh, this is a bookstore and book bug in Kalamazoo uh, and then books and books in Coral Gables down in the Miami area for helping put this together. Um, thank you both. And congratulations on Glory. Um, it's so beautiful. We Need New Names is one of my top al uh, books of all time, not albums. Thank you. And, and this thank was such you. a great like follow up. I, I waited so long and it did not disappoint. So anyone who has read your previous book, they will love this book as well. Yes. Um, thank you. Is there, I always ask this um, for both of you, is there a way to best find you on the internet? Is there a website we can go to? Do you not like the internet? Do you not like social media? Where can we? <laughs> I do not like the internet. I do not like <laughs> social media, but I can be found on uh, on Facebook. Yeah, I've been, I've had to, to be present. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the past few weeks. And then I have a website as well, noviolettulawai.com. Megan, where can we find you? You're, I know you're, you're busy at, at Catapult, but you're on the internet, right? <laughs> I'm on the internet. I'm on Twitter <laughs> at Make How Much. <laughs> yeah, perfect. And you can find us at ChatterCover.com. Uh, we'll, I'll link the other bookstores in the YouTube chat too, so you can support them. Please support all independent bookstores. Thank you both so much for an amazing conversation. I, I can't wait to see what else you, you both write. Thank you. And thank you so much, Mega. That was lovely. Thank you, No Violet. Such a pleasure. Really special. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. Perfect. We are no longer live. I just want to thank you both.